changes in organisms may become fixed in the genes. Let's look at evolutionary change and genetic fixation. You know that evolution happens by a natural selection, the process sometimes called survival of the fittest, where fitness is equal to reproductive success or the number of offspring of an individual that survived to reproduce. Natural selection acts on the phenotype, the expression of the genes, the attributes that an individual organism has, not on the genotype itself. The phenotype is determined by both genes and the environment so that individuals best suited for the prevailing environment are selected for. That is, they reproduce better, leave more survivors, and pass more of their genes to the next generation. There are three main kinds of natural selection, stabilizing, directional, and disruptive. Stabilizing selection selects for the average, and you can see in the diagram here, on the top, there's a distribution of traits, and in the middle, they're the most, the average. These are favored, so that distribution becomes higher and more pointed. There's selection for those and against the extremes. Directional selection favors one extreme or the other. If at one end the fitness of those is better, selection will move that curve to the right, the distribution of traits, the distribution of phenotypes, I should say. And disruptive selection is against the average. It favors both extremes. So you can see what happens with that. One of the most famous examples of evolution is that seen in the finches of the Galapagos Islands, first noticed by Charles Darwin, where there was radiation of species to fill open niches on islands as a new species colonized the archipelago. It then moved to another island and changed. Radi this new species formed. The beaks sizes shifted when the finches were competing with other species to specialize in niches that were less um, full. And there were both short-term evolutionary changes and long-term evolutionary changes. Looking at this little finch with his broad, strong beak, you can see he is adapted, well-suited, for cracking seeds. In the late 70s, there was a drying uh, period, and the abundance of seeds dropped as well as hardness increased and as seed hardness increased the width and strength of the beaks of the seed cracking finches increased. After this period of time in wetter years seeds became small, softer and the beaks became smaller again. In any situation, the stronger the selection, the more quickly the changes will occur in a population. If there are slow changes in the environment, we see gradual changes in natural populations. But sometimes, often a human intervention will cause a drastic shift, as was seen in the case of the peppered moth. H. B. Kettlewell was a scientist who described industrial melanism in British moths, the species Biston betularia, the peppered moth. It has a natural color. It's light with black spots on it, so it looks like it has pepper on it. And occasionally, a dark individual is produced that has lots of melanin in it. This is the carbonaria form. Over the years, that dark form became more and more common in industrialized regions because the factories 
spewing out ash and pollution were coloring the bark of the trees darker. Where there were no factories, still the light form was predominant, and it turns out that the color was determined by a single dominant gene for melanism, so it was easily, quickly selected. Name Biston betularia, the species epithet betularia, is from the, the birch, the genus name for the birch tree is betula, and betula Papyrifera and other species have light-colored bark, so the moths rest on the tree trunks during the day, and they're camouflaged. If, however, their the forma carbonaria was produced, a black moth sitting on a white tree would be quickly nabbed by the birds that like to eat moths. So Kettlewell did mark recapture experiments with both forms, and he found that the more the dark forms had much better survival in industrial areas, whereas light forms survive better in unpolluted areas. This makes sense because if the trees are black and a white moth sits on it, a bird will be more likely to eat the white moth than a black moth, which would be camouflaged. As People became aware of smoke harming the natural environment. Putting smoke control programs into effect, there were fewer melanistic moths. So in this figure on the left y-axis, the mean winter sulfur dioxide concentration, an indication of pollution, it was reduced over the years, and the frequency of the melanistic moths also declined the right-hand y-axis. So I think you can see where it's black, the black moth is camouflaged on a light trunk, the white moth would be hard to see. This question, are phenotypic differences determined genetically, is a really important one, especially in sessile organisms. And some plants should occur over wide elevational ranges and they look very different at, in, from one place to another. So work in the mountains of California was done by a team of scientists, a taxonomist, a geneticist, and an ecologist. And before those guys, the wor work of Gutta Turrison, he had done common garden experiments, bringing plants of different forms that were seemingly the same species to a common garden and seeing if they maintain their differences. This team of Klaus and Keck and Heise did something that was innovative called reciprocal transplant experiments, taking pieces of plants from low, mid, and high elevations in the Sierra Nevada and transplanting them to other locations. If you take seeds from plants at the different elevations, bringing them to a common garden like Turrison did, they make plants of different heights. So on the x-axis, the elevation from which the seed was collected, different names of those sites here, and when they're grown all together at Mather, let's say, this was the distribution of their heights. You can see the seeds collected from high elevation alpine plants produce plants very short. But this team and many ecologists afterwards have taken advantage of the fact that many plants are easy to divide. You can make cuttings and grow different pieces of the same genetic individual. In other words, these are clones. So you can transplant these clones to different elevations, and Klaus and Keck and Heise found that some of the differences were maintained upon transplanting. Morphology differences such as height and leaf shape, and phenology, the time they flowered and how long the plants were dormant. Other investigators studied later the reproductive allocation and you could see from the previous silhouettes, the lower elevation plants had more flowers, the higher elevations smaller and more, more leaf, a greater 
leaf to flower ratio. Photosynthetic characteristics also differ and water use efficiency. This is a beautiful figure from the original work from Clausen et al. published a long time ago. But I love it because it shows the data from each site in such a beautiful way. They have the silhouette of the plant, the average plant, and you can see next to each plant, which is the average plant, a distribution of the individuals, all of the heights, and how a frequency distribution, how many had each of the heights. So the lower elevation wet coast, west coast site, are taller than the rest and have a lot of flowers. As you go higher in elevation, the plants get smaller and less is allocated to flowering, that kind of reproduction. And these are data for the yarrow, Achillea lanulosa. Here are some beautiful graphs, two clones from Mather from one elevation at about a thousand meters, 1400 meters, taken to different elevational sites and each of these lines of silhouettes show the different plants that resulted from the clones and in a vertical column are pieces of the same genetic individual at the different elevations. So you can see the Mather plants at the bottom when they're planted at lower elevation at Stanford all survived. They were different heights and when taken to timberline, very high elevation, <clears throat> some didn't even survive, and they all grew much shorter, those that survived. So what this shows is the environment makes a big difference on the phenotype. It's not wholly determined by the genotype. However, the genotype limited the expression of the phenotype, especially when clones were taken to different places. So Klaus and Keck and Heise called the different plant types races or ecotypes. They found ecotypes at each of the places they studied. But really these are specified ranges on a continuum, the ecocline. And these sorts of clines exist in lots of organisms. Here's an example in a cricket, a popular invertebrate in Japan for their singing and good luck bringing abilities. You can see that in northern Japan, developmental time is much shorter than in southern Japan, and the shorter the developmental time, the smaller the head width of the adult cricket. And I think perhaps the size of the cricket may correlate with how they sound, too. So ecologists still use this word, ecotype, to mean a population of a species that has a genetically based phenotypic difference, that is, a race. And genetic differences among ecotypes results from natural selection exerted by local environments. And those selection pressures have caused certain traits to be fixed in those different environments. Some ecotypes get taxonomic status. And one of our native plants, the pitted stripe seed, Pyriqueta caroliniana in the Turneraceae, has two varieties, named varieties, in the pine rocklands. The plants are of shorter stature and wide, broad leaves, and that's variety tomentosa. But in the Marl Prairie, plants are taller with narrow, linear leaves, and this is variety glabra. Currently, we consider these one species, but with named varieties that may well be ecotypes.